You know, one of the most powerful partnerships that I think exists in the National Geographic family and certainly that I have had the privilege uh, to, to witness since my time here is the wife and husband team of Beverly and Jarek Barrett. Beverly and Derek Joubert, my apologies. Um, they are remarkable in, in, every, in every word. They are explorers at large. They are the founders of the Big Cat uh, Initiative. And they are passionate about conservation. And they are internationally renowned filmmakers. They were not able to join us last year. And we are so grateful that they have made the journey back to this stage and will join us this morning in conversation to talk about their work and their renewed commitment to saving big cats and so much more. Please welcome the Joubert's. Good morning. Good morning, Emma. How are we doing? <laughs> great, thank you. Couldn't be better. Thank you great. That's great. You know, last when I first joined uh, National Geographic in 2016, I had the extraordinary good fortune uh, to visit with you in uh, in Botswana and in uh, and we were even in, in Johannesburg, and it was a life changing experience. And one of, the, one of the most profound moments um, for me was being out in the bush and we came across a herd of buffalo. <laughs> I thought we weren't gonna say buffalo today. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I remember we, were, we were surrounded by buffalo and they were magnificent and you spoke about their magnificence and their importance uh, in, 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 our, in our species preservation. But on March 3rd, 2017, you had a different kind of encounter with the buffalo. We certainly did. <laughs> Can you, um, do you mind just sharing yeah, what sure. happened? No, we're not gonna talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we can, definitely. And uh, we haven't really shared this publicly before, so this will be the first time, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but I would like to warn everyone, we're going to possibly show some images, if that's yes, all right. Yes, yes, please. Um, so those that are sensitive, maybe um, uh, put your heads in your handbags and things, because uh, it's, um, it's... It's not too it's, bad. Yeah, it's fairly graphic. Um, as we say, in, uh, we were in camp, we were out in the bush about uh, 7.45 and we were going actually to dinner. Uh, Beverly had decided to surprise me, it was my birthday um, and sure, it was a surprise indeed. Well, it was also World um, Wildlife Day, yeah. which I think um, was a little surprised to get a slap in the face from a buffalo. But um, really what happened th that evening, we were walking along um, off to that main area, as Derek said, and the next minute, um, all that I heard was this incredible snorts coming out of the darkness. Uh, he truly surprised us. Um, then the last thing I saw was the wild eye of this buffalo. And you could see he was crazed. You know, when somebody is fearful, you get all the white around the eye mm -hmm. and red. And, um, and then, of course, he concussed me. Uh, I then woke up on his horn and I was riding the buffalo. Um, at the time, I had no idea I was impaled. Uh, he had impaled me by going to under the armpit and you know, right up through the chest. Um, but as I was riding the buffalo, he was galloping off into the darkness. Um, I just remember sort of giving a silent plea of help and then saying to myself, I'm alive, I'm alive. And I said it three times and then this overwhelming blackness just you know, took me again. Derek, where were you? Uh, I went for a drink in the camp. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> no, so what actually happened is the buffalo came out and we had that three second warning. Uh, smacked me like one second before it smacked Beverly. Um, broke my pelvis, broke two ribs, cracked two other ribs and sent me skittling down the path on my backside. So my uh, perspective was that as I was going down, I could see Beverly riding the, the boss of the buffalo and running off into the darkness. Um, so somehow I managed to get up and I ran after them and uh, the buffalo ran in a, in a sort of semi-circle and so I, I, I shortened the distance and got into them. Um, and just, I guess you, you think on your feet, um, but I landed on my left foot and then swung a, a, a kick on, with my right foot and I kicked the buffalo just under its front leg and um, because of that he tried to get to me and he flicked his head and tossed Beverly off and she landed at my feet. And that's probably when I had that overwhelming blackness and landing on the ground, uh, my next um, sort of recollection, I was still out, but I just remember fingers going under my nose and I realized that Derek thought I was dead and he was doing that test of whether I was breathing or not. So I tested to see if Beverly was alive um, and while I was doing that, our friend the buffalo came back, turned and came running back in towards us uh, so I jumped over Beverly and then uh, ran directly at the buffalo, because if you'd run over Beverly, it would have not been pretty. Um, and so I ran towards him and uh, off at 45 degrees, he ran in after me, knocked me down again, and possibly that's where the pelvis crack came from. Um, and then ran over me and I went back to Beverly, tested if she was alive. And then, um, then I had to make the hardest decision of my life, I think. What was that? Um, all my military training and all medical training uh, or first aid training says when a patient has had a, a trauma like that, you don't move the patient. And, uh, but I thought about it. I wondered what, what I should do because if I moved Beverly, I had a real good chance, certainly looking at her lying there, of breaking her back or her neck. Um, but if I left her there and she woke up, she was going to give me hell for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I opted for the uh, broken back option. So, um, <laughs> so I picked her up and I cradled her, her head in my elbow and then, and then walked about 150 meters with her. And at some point then my, my pelvis said, this is a terrible idea. And so I, I fell down on my knee and I, and I dropped her, her feet to the ground. And that's and when you woke up again. Yeah, I, um, I came around um, and I sort of uncrumpled myself um, in the position I was in. And I straight away said to Derek, don't try and pick me up. I'm way too heavy. I can walk. And so <laughs> off I went for about 150 meters, um, obviously cradled in Derek's arm until we could get, you know, onto the ground. And that's where I stayed for 11 hours, bleeding out five pounds of blood. Um, and, and then, of course, getting to the emergency rooms 18 hours later. Right. And so what did recovery look like? Well, um, emotionally, what, what it looks like is, you know, we, we did some art like this, for example. Uh, it's one way for us to process that. Um, Beverly died at 2.32 uh, in the morning when, when I was the only, only help there. You died again at 4.40. Um, and you just stopped coming back, you know, stop dying at some point. And, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I do know that, that you, there was a, a moment where I was sort of giving medication, painkillers mainly, giving some to Beverly and then every now and again giving some to myself, giving some to Beverly. But at some point you said, uh, stop medicating me. Yeah, I got to the point that I realized that it was way more serious than I initially thought. And I saw the amount of blood um, and obviously the way I was feeling. And I just said to Derek, stop medicating me because I want to be fully conscious if I have to say goodbye. Right. And so that was a tender moment. But of course, um, you know, lying in hospital, uh, we had many moments of, you know, looking at what's happening on this planet and how we need to be stronger. I mean, I thought of everybody um, at National Geographic and I thought, I can't leave you doing all, <laughs> all the work. <laughs> Derek and I needed to be out there as well. Yeah. One of the things that I used, um, this is actually after the reconstruction. So, um, one of the things I used on the day, we have a drug we use for darting rhinos. And so all that we had was this ketamine. 
Um, and so I had to calculate weight of Rhino, weight of Beverly, and uh, figured that out and, and got it right, thankfully, and injected her with ketamine. So um, there, I think you guys saw this maybe last year, but most certainly the, the facial fractures were large, uh, 21 broken bones just in the face, 30 altogether. Um, so fairly traumatic. One of the big things that we discovered, and this was a journey of discovery for us even when we got to hospital, is that the horn actually went in under Beverly's arm through uh, collapsed a lung, up through the clavicle, through the back of her throat, through the back top of her mouth, through up into all of these bones that are shown, and then stopped one millimeter short of the optic nerve. Um, and then came out. So there was no external uh, cut at all, which was, which was quite amazing. So um, it was a, a long journey for us that uh, you know, ended, first of all, with that. Walking out two and a half months later. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And I have to say, this is a moment that I need to thank each and every one of you for sending such incredible messages. I felt like you were lifting Derek and I with all this incredible energy that was coming our way. But I've never publicly thanked um, the seventh uh, surgeons. Uh, they did a remarkable job in keeping me alive. Um, and at the same time, I know I gave them hell because um, we only had a couple of weeks and I wanted to get back into, you know, filming the big cats out there. We already had a project going. And we also had a deadline. Our deadline was on the 21st, we were moving rhinos. And it was going to be one of the most amazing um, you know, relocations. And so I said to the surgeon, um, you have to know that you have to get me out. And I saw his eyes got very big, the professor. <laughs> but one, of, one of the things that happens you know, in, in, a, in a situation like this, right? You, one of two things you either retreat and you, you go and you like you don't want to you don't want to venture out into the world again and the other thing that happens potentially is that you have a renewed sense of purpose of vigor of passion for your work and i'm sensing the latter is true for you <laughs> absolutely well, definitely. You know, one of the things was that uh, Beverly's epiglottis was, was paralyzed and, and forced back. So for many, many months, she couldn't eat or drink. And, and uh, at some point, the surgeons told me that she would never eat or drink again. And then slowly, we started giving her some water and some other things. And uh, one day, they said to me, um, we're going to try some bubbled water. And so we, we tried that. And it went down because of the consistency of the bubbles. And they said, now she can have bubbled water. So I broke, a, broke out a bottle of champagne. I saw bubbles <laughs> about it. <laughs> but I really, I really do think that you get three kinds of people. Those that are sort of victims and they, and they react fairly well. Those that really collapse under these sorts of things. And others that, like Beverly that, um, that rise to the occasion and, um, and take the moment to, to change gears and really figure out what life's all about, and how to, how to be more effective at what's important. On my side, I, you know, there were times there where I was um, holding Beverly's hand and saying, geez, if I only had one more minute, uh, one more hour, what would I do with it? And I'd drink champagne, of course, but uh, <laughs> um, having gone through that, I'm now determined that unless I'm saving the world or having fun, and hopefully at the same time, it's hardly worth getting up in the morning. So. Absolutely. Life is precious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to end by saying life is precious. Everything on this planet, all life is precious. And we really are wasting life if we're not standing up for what we believe in and taking action now. We don't have time. We can't be complacent. And so now is the time. Well, Beverly and Derek, I know we wish we had more time, but thank you so much for joining us on stage this morning. We are so thankful um, that you are here. We're so grateful for all your work. And I know I speak for everyone here where we just, we want to say we love you. 
Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.